And my fourth point in this part is this. Learn to check them up. Learn to check them up. You know, no doubt the biggest issue in relationships is always communication. My husband doesn't talk to me, we don't talk anymore. Though. You know, you hear that story before? You don't talk to me. You know, I have a friend, they're a couple, and uh, they have two kids now. And the, the wife has a rule that every night they must spend 20 minutes talking and not doing anything else. It can't be while, it can't be eating dinner, it can't be um, while the kids are around, it can't be watching TV, they must sit there and talk. Um, that's their rule. Because they think, she thinks communication is so important. Okay? And good for them. Communication is the key to all relationships. And the same way in the workplace environment, you need to learn communication skills. There's a quote I've got here, that people in organizations, in organizations typically spend over 75% of their time in an interpersonal situation. That is no surprise to find that at the root of a large number of organizational problems is poor communication. Effective communication is the essential component of organizational success, whether it be at the interpersonal, intergroup, intergroup, organizational, or external level. And so what it's saying is that when communication breaks down, things go wrong. And as I said, some of you here need to develop your communication skills. Why? A, because English is not your first language. You may have to learn the, the, the actual keys of professional communication in Australia. For some of you, you might have to improve your English a bit. Others have to learn about Australian culture. You may have to learn about sarcasm. Um, that's the biggest thing I find when I travel around the world is that like, my American cousins don't get sarcasm, and they think I'm being serious and offending them when I'm being sarcastic. And so people may say things to you that are sarcastic, and you'll be offended and cry and sue them for harassment and realize they're joking, and they can be bad, right? So, um, communication is also so important. How are you going to communicate to an employer? See, if you can't communicate effectively, how are you going to sell yourself at that interview? I know, I, I know a lot of, from my culture, the Asian culture, a lot of people are just quiet. Uh, Asian, a lot of my clients are very mousy people. Well, if you go to an interview and you sit there, yes, no. I mean, it's not that you're wrong or wrong, you're just, you're just not used to the boisterous Australians out there who sell themselves and say how fantastic they are. You will be at a disadvantage. And let me tell you, I know, I know a lot of people who've learned communication skills, who are quiet people. A lot of career managers I meet along the way, they tell me stories of very quiet people who learned the skills. It can be learned. I could never public speak when I was younger. I learned the skills of public speaking because of my profession and I needed to do. I learned how to communicate, I learned how to project my voice, etc, etc. These are skills you can learn. Universities run them, groups run them, I'm sure you run them in your career development courses. So they're things that you can do. Because you need communication skills to, to, to be able to sell yourself. And the same way, you need the good communication skills to sell your status. And to convince the employer that as an overseas student, you'll work hard. Which is the second part of my talk. Because you may have the best profile, but if you can't un let an un employee understand that you have a, you have applied for PR, or you've applied for a foreign card, or you're on a bridging visa, and you can't effectively communicate that, you're going to struggle. Yeah. Who knows that a lot of employees don't, get, don't understand that? Yeah. Who's applied for jobs and basically says, are you a PR or not? Yeah. You aren't, you've been at home? It, it's a lot of people, for some reason in Australia, a lot of employees don't understand this whole visa thing. What's a bridging visa? You've got to bridge the visa on what doing you know, you know, What is that? I mean, and so, you have to sell yourself, because if all you do is say, apply for a job that says, we take people who are not PRs, who knows there's a very limited thing. I know so many of my clients who've gone out there, particularly to small to medium enterprises, and that's always my key, target the small to medium enterprises, the blue water. I mean, if you're an accountant, you target your KPGs and your price waterhouses and your, all your big firms, you know, who knows that everyone's applying for them. And, and if you, can you get in, jolly good. But if you can't get in those jobs, who knows, there's a thousand accounting firms out there. In the suburbs, even in the city, there's probably a hundred accounting firms out there. And unless you network, unless you find those people, you'll never be able to do that. And I find that it's the small to medium enterprises that are more amenable to high interest students. They might not get it. A lot of the bosses are like, I don't get it, but you know, if you handle it, I'll be fine. So we always speak to the employer about it and we help them understand it. But you have to be able to go out there and sell your visa status, which I'll talk about in the second half of my talk. So, the first part is about the art of employee dating. Did you learn something? Something a little bit? Yeah? Okay, good. So, the second part is about the whole visa thing. Now, I won't go in depth about the visa stuff because it's complicated. I'll go through some of the major changes and to help you along the way. I'm um, Karen. Is she Karen? 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 I do a lot of advocacy work with the students. If you want questions, just email me at your page. Okay? It's difficult for me to cover everyone in this time, so just email me a question, or if you want to, come see me in the city, 
we always give free consultations to students. Um, everyone say free consultation. Free? Who likes free? Who likes free? Okay. Um, if you don't say free, people still tell me, but how much do you charge? So I, um, I'm happy to see discussion face. It's easy to email sometimes, but when it comes to see me, I'm happy to go through your face with you, Karen, if you have my card. You can contact me through uh, my card or through Slack or other people. But the, the, this is called navigating the visa mindful, because this is going to mindful here. Because there's two parts to it. A, no one visa you can apply for, and B, selling that to an employer. I've talked about before. So, the visa situation is very easy to explain, it's just really hard. Yeah? Um, unless you get out of eight after uni, forget about it. And unless you are on the list, you're not going to be able to apply. You know about that, right? There's a list that changed in July this year, that, uh, September last year, sorry. That went from that, from everyone to about 180 occupations, and essentially it's accounting, engineering, doctors, but even then you have to do a registry, registry, uh, internship. Um, anyone else know gets uh, IT people, etc., etc. So there is a limited list. So the first question is, am I on the limited list for PR purposes? And if not, what can I do? Well, if you okay, let's go to the, if you're on the list, you essentially need out of eight. Who's who's gone out of eight before? All these drones are hard. Who's got an answer to Anyone? No. Um, it's hard. Okay. I've had a UK client not get paid before in every band. I mean, he's probably drunk when he did it, but he, you know, it's not easy to get out of in every band. But if you can, jolly good. And then if you're an out of person and you get your, and you're on the list of accounting, engineering, IT, etc., etc., then you may get a buy straight up to you. Okay. So, what are some of the courses here? Throw out your courses. Anyone from pharmacy here? Pharmacy, two of you? No. It's really confusing actually. Um, when the list changed, chemists were on the list, but not pharmacists. I had one, client, one person who applied by himself, and he applied because he thought chemist and pharmacist, whereas chemist means chemistry person. Okay, and he obviously failed. Um, but then uh, pharmacists are now back on the list. What other profession have you? Journalism. Journalism, yep. Yeah. Aerospace. Aerospace, well, very smart. <laughs> 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 I, I, I always want to be aerospace engineer. You know, you always want to be an astronaut, whatever. But you know, like, you're hard enough. aerospace, yep. Yeah. Hospitality. Hospitality. Nurses. That's all. Yeah. Nurses, yeah. right? Logistics. Sorry. Logistics. Logistics, yeah. Anything else? Childcare. Childcare. Mm -hmm. Community services. Okay. So there's a range of things. Now, probably, who knows that they're on the current list for PR? Put your hand up. Okay, probably four of you. Great. <laughs> so the rest of you are really complicated. Yeah. I remember five years ago, I used to do this. Everyone was on the list. Everyone could apply. My life was so easy. Now all my cases are complicated. Um, we're always thinking of solutions. But most of you here are looking for the second part of my talk, which is what can I do then? I'm not on the list. I'm not on the list. What can I do? Okay. So some of you here can apply for the 485 because you were here before. You got your visa before 8th of February 2010. Who has been here for at least since 2010, semester one? It's about half of you. Who hasn't, who started this year? Okay, so what if you here started this year, you can't come under the transitional. Okay, and I won't go through everything about that, but essentially, people who've been here since last year who had their student visa for April, February to 10 can still apply under the old list. And it's very really confusing, the list on the website is even more confusing, but essentially, if you were here before 2010, you may be able to apply, if not, you think of other options. And so, some of you can get the temporary visa, which at least allows you to work for a while. It's an 18-month visa. There are still the minimum requirements of studying for at least two years, or about four semesters, possibly a bit less. Um, you still have to have decent English, which is an answer of six in each band. You have to apply within six months of getting your results. And there are things that essentially apply to all of you who want to apply in the skill program. But go see an agent, go see a lawyer to find out more about that, or look at the immigration website. And so, the first category of people who can apply for PR directly, which is at the moment, none of you can, if you can't get out of eight. Then some, those of you who can't get out of eight can still apply for the 485, including people who were here last year. But the rest of you are thinking, what do I do, right? What do I do? It's such a small list. Um, I'll go through some of the other changes. Uh, I don't know what order we've got. Okay, next page. Next page, yep. So some of the recent changes are the change in the points test that went up from, well, it didn't go up, it's changed from the 65 pass mark. And essentially, you need really high English now to apply. Um, the list is changing and things happening. One thing that's happening next year 
is called the, uh, keep going to the next papers, it's called the Skill Migrant Selection Model, which comes in July 1 next year. And just briefly, essentially, this is like the RSVP.com of immigration. You have to be, you put your, you, you go to the database and you're invited to apply. So you can't just apply for PR anymore even next year after July 1. You must actually put an expression of interest in, and then if you're good enough, they'll invite you. And essentially, people with the higher points get invited first, and the lower people have to wait. Um, there's not a lot of information about it. It's an offshore application at the moment. Um, watch this space. Hopefully next year more information will come. But know that there's another big change coming next year, July 1, which is called the migrant selection model. Okay. Any questions about that? No, yeah, it's music. Um, but essentially you're invited to apply it. So if you don't come under the I apply directly, or if you don't come under the I'm under the transitional range, or I can apply for the 4 what can I do? Well, essentially there are three sponsorship uh, pathways. Uh, next, next slide. There are three sponsorship pathways you can look at. Uh, keep going to the three, three sponsors. The first, so this is the changes which is reduced points, more difficult for overseas students to apply. Keep going. Um, I talked about the standard. Next slide. So, um, most of our work these days is done through sponsorship. So, three things. You want to say sponsorship? Sponsorship. Again. A lot of your pathways is about sponsorship. The first is the state and territory sponsorship. Every state and territory in Australia has been given a mandate of about 5,000 places to sponsor people of need, that they need. And a lot of occupations are on the list. A lot of IT occupations. I heard the history chef was on um, Western Australia, etc., etc. So there are options for you in your area to get sponsored for a particular state. Now, obviously the smaller territories like ACT and probably Tasmania have a bigger list. But most of them most of them will require you to live there and work for a while. But there are options. It's supposed to be a development of this uh, pathway to help target school shortages. So there's state sponsorship. There's also employer sponsorship. Now, this is a bit of a chicken and egg sometimes, because a lot of employers won't hire people without PR, and you can't get the visa without an employer. So I understand the chicken and egg thing. But, know that there are a lot of people I meet in my work who are getting employer sponsored visas. And again, the main way is through smaller companies, <coughs> SMEs, small to medium enterprise. Through companies who um, are essentially there may be like some examples are a manufacturing company who hired a guy as an accounts clerk and they're sponsored for a working visa and eventually go to PR. A commodities company that hired a shipping merchant clerk. So there are different ways, but all, a lot of my clients who get their things are through the small companies. I actually had a guy who worked as the distribution manager of a classroom company. They had 30 staff, etc. Cetera, et cetera. So employer sponsorship, whilst difficult as possible, and the thing is, what I find is, employers will not sponsor someone unless you work for them part-time first. So you need to go out there and get the part-time work. And it may not even be directly career-related to staff. Okay? A lot of people work as admin staff, as a set receptionist, as whatever in a company and work their way up. And a lot of you here who are working will have those stories where, you know, I met a guy who basically started off doing as a postboy. He did the speech with his he did a talk with me, he started like a male person and worked him way up. Now he's a business development manager of a big organization. Okay. So he worked his way up. But some of you have to have that pathway because, again, it's difficult for you to start at the graduate employment pathway. There are permanent <coughs> pathways to migration, but essentially, to be sponsored for a permanent visa, you will have to have experience. So for fresh graduates, it's almost impossible. In, you know, um, they normally require three years' experience to be sponsored by a company for PR directly, and they're fairly strict on that. You can waive it, but for fresh graduates, unless it's specifically in a very niche area, like a petroleum engineer or something where they really have to people, then it's difficult. And there are regional pathways. And this is where we do a lot of our work now. Who knows a little bit about regional migration pathways? Who knows a little bit about that? A few of you, not many of you. But essentially, you can apply for regional migration spread out of university. You don't, you only have to have an answer about 5.5 .5 sometimes. Um, you only have to have very functional interest a lot of the time. You don't have to have a high arts. Um, but as long as the position is genuine and you can justify it, then you get PR straight out of it. 
We do a lot of clients who've got jobs in Adelaide, for instance, as vets, as whatever, and they get sponsored by employers, they get the other People working in Ballarat, doing people in Bendigo, Geelong, etc., etc. Now, again, you've got to find the job out there. But there are job opportunities in the smaller, popul- in the lower population areas. And essentially, you get PR directly, there are lower thresholds. There is a requirement to commit to work there for two years, um, and they can cancel your PR if you don't. But for a lot of my clients, that's what they do. We have clients buying businesses and companies and doing joint ventures. And so the regional migration is a focus of the government, and the government is looking to help people migrate those areas. And the last is spouse sponsorship. Now, some of you are giggling here, but you know, the dating thing again, we do a lot of de facto visas and married visa visas. I remember, I, I, I can never forget, when I had a Ukrainian client who uh, came to me for a visa flight, and part of his speech was, I want to get a visa stay here, and you know, I want to, in this one year, I want to find a nice girl, we move it together, we have a nice time, not just for visa, not just, but we want, I want to find someone. So, so this guy's visa strategy was to shack up, shack up with a girl and uh, get a visa. Um, all true, but he, Hopefully that was his predominant reason, but um, you know, it's legitimate to, to apply for a spouse visa, and we do heaps of them, and it's one of the biggest programs, the spouse visa. Now, spouse is married, or living together for a year, you can be housemates and not be spouses, the immigration knows that, you're not so daft, so you can't be sponsored by your flatmate, okay? <laughs> <laughs> but, there are options there. It, it, it recognises same-sex couples, uh, normal, uh, heterosexual couples, um, married couples, so it's all recognized under the law, which is essentially for de facto couples, if you're living together for a year, you must have evidence, because you can't be boyfriend and girlfriend and not de facto. So you must have joint access, joint liability, you must argue a lot. Um, but there are things to look at and to be able to prove your de facto status. And so sponsorship is a big thing. Now, again, you may think that, oh, it's too difficult, um, it's too horrible, but look, it is hard now. I don't, I don't shy away from that. But, um, it's definitely a situation where, if you're proactive, if you go to the blue water, if you do more to show yourself, you have a greater chance. And today is really about maximizing your chance to get. I'm not saying that if you just do what I say, you get a job tomorrow, but what I can say is that I, I'm pretty confident that if you apply some of these principles, you will increase and you will find opportunities that you wouldn't have found otherwise, because you'll be more proactive. And I move to my last slide, which is just this. No, next slide. You only need one. You know, how did I get my job? I've been working in the same place since I've been shooting. I well, did, finished my law degree, I couldn't get a job, so I did my master's. <laughs> Not because I love the law, I hated studying law, but I did my master's. And essentially, I uh, hated the master's, but during that time, my dad was in Thailand at the time. He was working in the biotech industry. And he met a lady during the confer- uh, biotech conference. From Melbourne, and they were talking on from Melbourne, and then she said, Oh, you know, my, my dad said, My dad, my son's a law student. Oh, my, and she said, My mother's godson's a lawyer. Six weeks of person. My mother's godson's a lawyer. So dad brings me and goes, Oh, I met this woman whose mother's godson's a lawyer. I'm like, Okay, dad, whatever. I know you love me, but I'm not going to read some random person in Taiwan whose mother's godson's a lawyer. Anyway, so to cut a long story short, um, I, got to, I, I worked for him for a bit. He sort of quit being a lawyer, eventually stayed on. I became his partner in 2000. And we've been in business ever since. Now we have a law firm of eight lawyers, eight people, six lawyers, and we've built it from the ground up. It's been hard work. Um, I was never a great law student. I was very, I was very average. I got six, 59, 59, 59 my first three law subjects. Consistency. Um, but, but just consistently bad. You know? Um, but you know, I had average marks. I couldn't, I had a few interviews, I had a few classes, but through my dad's networking, through my persistence, and through working from the bottom up, you know, I got terrible pay to start. We had a small office, we built it up, and I've been at the same place for 13 years. And my point is, you only need the one job offer, you never know what happens. You may get rejected 50 times, but if you get that one acceptance, that's all you need. I've had one girlfriend my whole life, like, I've had a lot of disasters, not work called girlfriends, but one girlfriend, one wife, okay, and I've had one job. And the thing is, it can happen. And you can happen to be proactive and find your employer of choice through your business. It is definitely a daunting process for you. But if you are bright, think about blue, remember, remember nothing, think about blue water. If you go out there and look in the blue water, you'll make some <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.